So that was the first half of the Steel Experiments Lane. What do you all think? Whoa. 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 Like Still said, confusing. Still confusing after ever, the third time. First time I've ever seen it dubbed. Yeah. But I, I don't want to open that can of worms. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. the first time I've seen it dubbed, too. What are your thoughts overall on, I mean, one of the big things folks talk about is the story presentation and how confusing it is. Um, do you feel like it's something that is, um, that you, you can follow in terms of the, the clues it's leaving, or is it just, does it seem like chaos? The first time, it's chaos. First yeah. time? Well, the first time it should be Honestly, if, if it were more linear, it would be kind of, it would be much more boring, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It would not be nearly as interesting. <laughs> it was actually interesting to me watching it this time, realizing how um, um, it wasn't quite as chaotic as I thought when I when I watched it mm. uh, previous times. Where yeah, um, you know, it, it is telling the story in a relatively chronological. Manner. Uh, it's just jumping all around the different characters. Mm. Things going on, and you don't know who's who and what's what and why they're doing things. Yeah, when you all already know what's going to happen, you start to pick the little things you missed. Yeah, the first time you watched it, and it's it starts to unfold the puzzle, the mystery. Absolutely, absolutely. It's also interesting with, with the characters. I mean, um, you know, anime always likes to have its. its Outlandish characters. Yeah, it, it does, and and these are these are pretty mild characters, and, and yet yeah. they're still you know the, the typical sort of fourteen year old, fifteen year old kind of characters. You know that yeah. that is so popular, but they're not the outlandish. You know, I have weird powers or all sorts of stuff. It's people really. They don't weird. have hair that sticks out ten feet, and, <laughs> and and they don't have spiked their haircuts. Right. Yeah. It's actually quite remarkable. I mean, everyone looks very almost. Normal. Tell who's who. No, I I like that's that's why Yoshi Toshiabe is so great. Absolutely. He has this weird, almost kind of ethereal quality. Mm hmm Well, and he's famously said that he didn't. Uh, you know, he grew up in a household where he wasn't supposed to watch anime or read manga. So his whole artistic style was, was very much not influenced by that, which I think is one of the reasons it looks so distinctive. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. I and I, I like different uh, art styles. I think that mm. many uh, anime fans are too obsessed with cute styles, you know, big eyes. And I like different styles like Mononoke, Kemono Zoom, Kaiba, those types of. Because it, everything ends up being the same if, if it's always the same style, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, the whole it's style. It's too clean. Mm, mm -hmm. Sometimes, absolutely. But uh, you have to admit, you see a lot of shortcuts in animation. Oh yeah, <laughs> like you see a lot of reused backgrounds, mm. a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the animation is definitely. Mm. I, I think cheap is a you know an effective adjective. Yeah, you know, they just didn't have much cash. Yeah, I, I mean, think he... I mean, think about it. When you when they presented this a whole idea. To the producer, uh, I'm. I cannot imagine what the reaction would be. I like when <laughs> when uh, Lane came out of the cloud. It almost it sounds silly, but it almost reminded me of like uh, the Terry Gilliam animation. Oh yes, uh, <laughs> Holy Grail when God was suddenly appears. <laughs> well, that's another interesting thing. Actually, is, is how often the series uses um, almost cliched. Stuff in it where you have the doll, you have uh, uh, girls in very frilly outfits, things that are uh, even that that sort of um, Islander mask that was hanging out there. There's a lot in there that's just kind of meant to be very recognizable, iconic imagery. Well, yeah, when the plot is so complex, I mean, you have to kind of simplify the imagery at some point. Yeah, it's a pretty flat show too, color-wise. <laughs> I think it, it kind of uh, says that the world doesn't really matter in the sense that it's all white. Yeah. The background is not fully drawn. Mm -hmm. It's focused on the character, on 
she's self-centered. Well, I, I, I think that's like personally, I, don't, I, I didn't understand that, but I, I again, I, it gave me a sort of ethereal quality, yeah. mm. it's like the world was not one hundred percent substantially there. Right. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Well, and you get that with the whole imagery in, in the shadows yeah. and so forth. That this feels like it's it's almost like a, a dream world. Kind of raises the question: What is real? Is the wired more real than the? In, I, I, for some I, people, I, it's funny I, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. We we need like a a baton or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. I was interrupting. I was. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was saying that. The internet is something that is not tangible, but for some people it feels more real than the actual world. Yeah, it, no. Like the the character in the first episode, she killed herself because she she wanted to live in the in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we have uh, that sort that type of situation in, in in the real world here also. People that are obsessed with uh, like computer games, for example. MMOs, they have their own persona, they have lots of friends in in the internet, but in the real world they don't don't have any. Uh, yeah. But you know that the real world actually uh, and computer scientists always thought that it's just a collection of information mm. for the body, I mean for the brain. So if the brain somehow connected to the computer, it's just all, it's all information. So the digital world is part of the real world. Mm. They can't be separated because it's all information. And the brain just uh, recognizes what information out there. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, I mean, there, there's just um, one of the things I like that the show sort of plays with is this idea that um, it's asking a lot of questions. You know, it's bringing up these ideas about what the um, you know can the digital world and the real world really be seen as kind of two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly from our perspective in this actual reality. Um, the digital world is certainly part of the real world. I mean, we yes. interact with it and use it and so forth. And it's and you know, they are certainly um, you know part of each other, part of our lives. Um, so what do you what happens when you start thinking it from the other perspective, the other side? Mm -hmm. You know, there were, I, it reminded me of a short film a long time ago that I saw. The science fiction film that was the basic concept was that. Right now, like in the 21st century, uh, our environment has become so inundated with, you know, radio waves and, and wire, Wi-Fi signals and things mm. like that. And that, like, if you could, if you were able to see that range, you wouldn't be able to see an inch in front of you. And so it just mm. gets so piled up. And it, eventually, what happens in this story is that it actually becomes an environment that organisms start living in. Ah, uh, interesting. And yeah, that's like, kind of become a problem for insects because insects can pick up on those waves. Oh. So it's actually become a problem in Japan, I heard, or somewhere around there where bees have just been leaving. Interesting. Yeah. There's too much that is, That's fascinating. Yeah. Really cool. And, and of course, I mean, you get that in the, in the, the show with that constant buzzing hum yeah. of uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. It's very true. It's predominant in the the wires and that stuff. Yeah, you just can't get away from it. So yeah. it's an interesting thing. Um, and of course, it's hard to judge a series when you're halfway through it, and you know, to sort of pull things together uh, based on that. Especially if you're experienced, Lane. Especially, yeah. So I right. think that you are going to do a, a hangout twenty years from now, and we are still going to debate. <laughs> what the show really means. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, speaking of that, I was lucky enough to go to Otakon 2001, which they themed around Lane, and they actually had uh, Yoshoshi Abe, the character designer, Yasuki Ueda, the producer, there. 
um, and I was lucky enough to, to, to go to a, uh, the panel they were, they were on, and somebody stood up and said, so um, in the first episode, Blaine looks down at her fingers and the smoke comes out of her finger. <laughs> and read that that's a common <laughs> thing that people see in mm. right, and report having in like death dreams, and they're just about to die. So is the entire show like Lane about to die, and it's like one long you know story set in her consciousness, and that's the second before she dies, and there's this pause, and uh, Ueda said, "If you want to interpret it that way, that is absolutely <laughs> <laughs> like uh, J Jacob's letter. Yeah, she's dying yeah, yeah, yeah. her last dream mm -hmm, in, exactly. um, in purgatory." And, and, and they said that they explicitly designed the series so that you can interpret it however you want to, and that they were not going get, to get in the way of your own interpretation of the events and what they mean and so forth. So they had their own internal, you know, history and so forth. They, you know, they kind of understood what they thought happened, but they wanted. To, in fact, Abe talked about this with with designing Lane herself. He said he approached uh, that, that as though he was trying to um, trying to remember. Lane, like she, like he had met her at some point in the past, and he was trying to draw this person that he had known in the past. So there was very much that that approach to the entire series that they were. It's almost like they were reporting on something instead of telling you what happened. It's not one hundred percent objective. Exactly. If it's told from another perspective, some things are not going to correspond to reality. Absolutely. Um, I already had one great comment on one of my Blaine videos, which I was like, that actually explains things really well and is almost the opposite of what I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing I really liked about Lane, mm. is that it can be so relatable if you watch it twice, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, because the second time I watched it, I really kind of felt like I knew Lane, mm. you know what I'm saying? And it's really unique, and my friend, he watched Serial Experience Lane 2, and he saw Lane completely differently. Mm. It's really, really unique. One of the issues I've had, actually, is I tried to get a friend of mine to watch it, and she just, and, you know, she loves deep stuff, but she just could not get into it. It was too... Oh, yeah, I definitely understand that. Don't know what it was, but yeah, and um, have you guys had that experience where you, you go to somebody and they, they just sort of put the brakes on? Yeah, I have yeah. a friend that I've been trying to get to watch Lane, and he he watched the first episode and said, "I'm out." Yeah, because the show is it's like the antithesis of anime. Anime, uh, what people think anime is, it <laughs> doesn't have fight. And... It's not Naruto. <laughs> well, I haven't had that experience with Lane, but I've had that personally. I've had that experience many times before, where I either I've said been really really found meaning in something and no one else did or everyone else just saw something in a work that I what what are, what's the big deal? I don't get it. Yeah. That's happened quite a few times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Lane's one of those shows where it's it it's uh, you know certainly more likely. Um it's one of the reasons why it's it's hard to recommend the show. Mm -hmm. it, it's so unique. But also dramatically, it's just so slow. I mean, I think I was having that reaction when the old man was talking. It seemed like he was going to die mid-sentence, but he could go. Yeah. Like Ten minutes of exposition just thrown at you. And it really just brings any sort of, you know, narrative pace to a halt. Absolutely. And, of course, that gets worse later with a lot of the, you know, oh, and yeah. now, yeah. 15 minutes of just <laughs> stuff. And, yeah. What's the episode there as a, a guitar solo in the... Uh, like uh, uh, random yeah. scenes from all the episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, and that's the that's other a thing that's a cool episode. That's the other thing is that like the like you said earlier that they uh, threw threw red herrings in there. They threw like as in the like, in pornography and things. All, all sorts of stuff that they just straight out. Like I remember you said they straight up said yeah that that this is completely <laughs> meaningless. <laughs> we we just <laughs> well, and that's an interesting point. Actually, uh, getting back to the whole presentation is that I remember Kanaka, the writer, uh, Chucky Kanaka, saying that um, he intentionally structured the show like a horror series, and mm -hmm. that that was one of the ways in which he could kind of get across what he wanted to. Because horror, you can kind of you can you can 
construct a complicated narrative, you can throw mm. weird stuff in there, and people will kind of take it and accept it yeah. and try to figure out what's going on. And I think it's more frightening when you don't know what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really the, the payoff of the show is, is all yeah. the shocks and the weird, poignant scenes. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many, th many things that you can't... I couldn't expect that. I usually, sometimes when I watch anime, I usually know what will happen next, but oh, this yeah. one is totally different. Mm. Yeah, let's be honest. I mean, anime is not really well known for its um, shockingly new storylines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just completely shocking. There's that wonderful moment where uh, Lane's in her school and the, the ghosts come at her and sort of pass through her. <laughs> and it's weird because we've all seen sequences where you know, ghosts appear and sort of go through people. Yeah. But that is just really, really creepy. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. So... Here's a question I want to ask for those of you who haven't watched the show. What do you think is going to happen next? Who hasn't watched? Mm. Yeah, it's, who hasn't? Yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing is, I don't to talk remember. Really slowly. Huh. Uh, maybe she will upload her uh, her brain into the computer. You know, I, I don't mean to be like. Uh, 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 how do I, uh, I? I'm enjoying this all, but I kind of wish I, I hadn't seen it now because mm. it would. I kind of feel like it would have been more interesting if I didn't know what was happening and it would open up more possibilities. Now we all kind of know what's going to happen. You know, mm. we're going to this, this, this. So, I mean, we can kind of discuss the details, but it, it's much more set in stone, I guess. But this show, I don't know about you guys, but it's kind of hard to memorize. I remember a couple of scenes, yeah. but I've watched a couple of months ago, and now I watch again. It's like a whole, a whole new experience. It's a different. It's like I'm watching for the first time. Yeah. Just, just say I have now a, an understanding of the stuff. It's not as shocking. So, but I don't remember the actual events. So there's the flip side. Um, uh, for those of us who watched it before, what did you catch this time that you didn't notice before? Well, uh, Mika having sex, mainly. And, <laughs> and <I'm> like, Whoa! <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, she's getting her clothes on. Oh, that's what that means. <laughs> there's one moment I noticed early on um, in the first episode. Also, oh, um, I also uh, didn't yeah. get why... why I mean, it, they made the psyche. I have to present. They made it weird. I forget how they pronounce it. The psyche chip. They made it mm. when they first introduced it. They made it seem like this is going to be the huge chip that's gonna that's gonna finally, you know, supply the hardware mm. that can create the computer that will break down the barrier between the wired and the real world. And then uh, Lane's dad is like. Wait, you're you're gonna break down through a barrier? Oh, you must have a psyche chip. Oh, that's interesting. And I, I was just kind of like, why? It, it was really much too nonchalant about it. And I just went, did I miss something, or <laughs> was he expecting that, or I don't know. Oh, I think he was. I, I've I've always gone under the assumption that Yasuo knows ex uh, her father knows exactly what's going on. Um, he may be surprised at the rate of change, but he he's he's expecting it. You know, at the beginning, I thought uh, Lane had multiple personalities, mm -hmm. but still, mm -hmm. I think so because who who gave her the chip? Did you think she bought it? Like Ooh. and said it for herself, like nailed it. I like that. Right? Mm. That's a good uh, explanation, I think. Yeah, there, there are many weird things in this animation. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, that's sort of like perfect blue now. The personality yeah. dissociation. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I noticed in the first episode is that when Lane's ta uh, with her family uh, eating, she uh, she takes her spoon and flips it over, and there's a reflection in her eye, which she just kind of blinks at. And I realized that's a flash forward to a, a shot in episode 13, um, 
when she's like down in the bottom of that like thing and she looks up and that like, that, that shaft of light comes down in her eye. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure why they're flashing forward to that. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, light on her eye, same mm -hmm. as later on. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they planned it out pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly very well planned. From what I understand, in order to, in getting back to the previous conversation, uh, in order to make the show, they actually had to make the first episode on spec and you know, draw and make the entire thing, then go back to the financers, say, here's what it's actually going to look like and here's what it'll actually feel like, <laughs> and then they got the money to make the rest of it which I think is indicative of how we... And it's one of the reasons why it's important to go back and understand why when folks ask things like, I wish there were more shows like Lane. Well... There's a reason why there isn't. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, no one makes things like that. It's really, really bizarre. It's kind of like financially troublesome for them. If they mm -hmm. want to try doing something like that, because they have to invest a lot of time in that. And if they don't get the approval to go, they just use the whole time money. Yeah, well... well was the show a, a flop in Japan or, or su I don't successful? Know. From what I know, it was mildly... It, it was sort of a cult hit. Um, it was not a big financial success at all, but a lot of people paid attention and noticed it. Um, but I, it garnered the fan base, right? Yeah, it, it, it actually got a, a significant fan base within um, uh, the anime industry itself. Um, when Production IG did their big 20th anniversary series, Ghost Hound, they announced that they had gotten Jackie Kanaka, the writer of Lane, and um, Yutaro Nakamura, the director of Lane, and like part of the announcement was, you know, they were the ones who did, did Lane. And when they were doing the interview, the president, the president of Production IG said, um, while talking about it, you know, he said, as far as I'm concerned, if we can get something that's like half as good as Lane, I'll be very satisfied. Hmm. So apparently, folks within the industry really, you know, appreciate those guys and, and, you know, and see the show as remarkable. I, I think it was one of those things. That you just, just, well, think about it. How do you make money off this? Hmm. You know, what kind of? I mean, I know they they sold sell bear suits characters. But <laughs> no more. It's like the the beginning of the modern art. Mm. When they, at that time people didn't recognize the art, oh, yeah. but now and only the artists started buying it. But now mm. everybody say they understand it. <laughs> they probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only the that, artists know. Mm. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, I mean it's it's a, it's a weird show, and it's yeah. one of those things. That, it, like Kaiba is another great example of one of those shows where it's like. I'm glad it was made, but I, I'm surprised somebody paid for it. <laughs> One of those things. Cool. All right. Well, then, uh, we will have to schedule next session for sometime soon. i got to check my calendar. I've got some stuff that's uh, coming in and out. So we'll hopefully do it in the next uh, week or two. All right. Um, okay. We'll finish this thing up. Yeah. All right. All right. See you. Hi. Right. You know, it's always so weird when you hear your voice like played back to you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna listen to this and be like, oh my god, I can't believe that's what I sound like. It's gonna be uh, mortifying. That's what I feel like all the time. <laughs>